hello everyone. I'm Kinga Torbicka from the Center of French Culture and Francophone Studies at the University of Warsaw. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to our seminar of Geopolitical Tuesday. I'm very honored to host today Professor Niloy Ranjan, sorry for the pronunciation, Perfect. Perfect. from University of Dhaka in Bangladesh. And he will present today a lecture entitled What is Critical in South Asian Geopolitics, Statist versus Beyond the Statist Discourses. Hello and welcome in Warsaw. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. So um, I kindly remind also our students that the essay submission deadline is today, the 9th of January. So, and also for our audience on the Zoom, please turn off your microphones and cameras. And for your information, this conference is recorded and will be available on the YouTube channel. So at the beginning, I will present our guest. After our guest will present his lecture and afterward we invite you to question and answer session. So let me present Professor Niloy Ranjan. Um, Professor Nira, Niloy Ranjan Biswas is a professor at the Department of International Relations at the University of Dhaka. In 2016, he completed his PhD in international politics from University of London. He was a recipient of the Fulbright Fellowship to pursue a second master's degree in security policy studies at the George Washington University. In 2017, he completed the United States Institute of Peace Reserve Fellowship to conduct a postdoctoral study on community policing and its challenges in preventing violent extremism. He was the country lead research fellow to conduct a three years long research of measuring opportunities, opportunities for women in peace operation studies in collaboration with the Armed Forces Division, Prime Minister's Office, Government of the People's Republic of Bangladesh. So thank you very much for joining us today. And please, the screen is yours. Thank you so much, Professor. And um, so if you remind me, I, have, I probably have like 30 to 40 minutes time for the lecture or less than that, just, you know, you can suggest. Mm -hmm. Uh, you have maybe uh, about 30, 40 minutes for your lecture, and then we last uh, always about 30 minutes for discussion. Thank you so much. So I'll keep that in mind. So I'll, I'll finish in hopefully less than 40 minutes um, from now on. And thank you once again for the opportunity to you, Ambassador Thomas, um, all who have been involved in this um, in this you know lecture series. And I, I feel really honored to be part of it. I'm sure that I'm enough audible to all the participants who are here. And I can imagine there is an essay deadline and we have just finished all the deadlines in the December. There are new deadlines in my university as well. And I completely understand if more than 50% of your mind is completely engaged uh, into the essay. And hopefully some of the discussion would probably help to uh, would probably help a little bit if you were working anything on South Asian geopolitics for your essay. I do not know. I wish you all the best in advance for your essay deadlines. So I will share um, a set of slides, uh, but there is an there is an acknowledgement announcement because whatever I'll be speaking is actually an ongoing um, uh, book project that we have been continuing. We means like some of my colleagues from the Department of International Relations, University of Dhaka. Uh, we have been conducting in collaboration with some very fantastic South Asian scholars on geopolitics and international relations. And we are trying to find uh, an answer of this question. So what are, what discussions we have been doing in the last one and a half and years, and uh, we have presented in conferences, we have received feedback. Um, it's almost a book manuscript at, at, at this moment, probably with a 
slightly different title. Um, so we when when Ambassador Thomas uh, offered me to uh, to present something on South Asian geopolitics, I thought, why not we present this um, in front of uh, the young minds and see if there are some interesting questions which might uh, add also value to this last minute addition in the in the in the in the you know research scholar uh, scholastic project or endeavor that we have been doing. So the question is, and this is a very tricky question because we are trying to ask um, in a or but uh, you know particularly for this lecture i think this question would be interesting because you know when we talk about critical is it about a significant subject matter or we ask a very ontological questions which 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 we talk about like you know what is the perspective of of geopolitics at this moment so it's it's it can be a very practical question it can be a very theoretical question so to bring that into a more <clears throat> uh, kind of a practical uh, question um, uh, or, or or a more you know question that can be asked for the pur you know purpose of a research i think you know when we talk about geopolitics we of course brings the issues of borders uh, borderlands territoriality and there are very interesting you know, um, jargons or words which are very critical to discuss about geopolitics beyond the geopolitics that uh, is very much state focused. So, so major question of inquiry for this lecture, which is slightly deformed from the the larger book project that we have been working on, is you know uh, what what are the factors of transformation over the years, particularly in the recent time, that kind of identifies or indicates the criticality of regional geopolitics. The first question is whether, is there anything called a regional geopolitics? And what is that form in the context of South Asia? Now, what are the critical things at this moment? Because if I had the opportunity, I'd probably ask it in an in-person class that what do you think what is important about South Asia at this moment? And I'm sure that there would be um, you know, more than I think, you know, at least five different answers on that, including in the Pacific, including nuclear, you know, standoff between India and Pakistan, border issues, you know, you ask, um, you know, you name it, there'd be like hundreds of issues at that moment. And particularly where I am from, I teach at the University of Dhaka, Bangladesh, and we have just had our national elections day before yesterday, which has been quite um uh, a matter of discussion, not only within the country, but also with the region for many uh, different kind of, um, you know, rationale. So, you know, always it's quite interesting. It's not only about geography or the conventional understanding, i.e. the statist perspective or the realist perspective of geopolitics, uh, which we all understand, you know, Alfred Rimahan, uh, Rudolf Kesslen, um, and, and scholars like um, those. But at the same time, over the period of time, and particularly from the post Cold War era, I think the post statist, or you know, whether that is from the epistemological perspective or even from the ontological perspective, there are different alternative the theoretical lenses that has emerged as well. So, what are those, and how that explains the criticality of regional geopolitics is something very important. So, very quickly, and I'm sure that you know it's just a recapitulation of your mind, and I'm I'm quite sure that you all understand and you know are very well aware of the different schools or theoretical knowledges in this particular area. So, so you know, among many, I think when we talk about the theoretical debates regarding. Um, you know, the district uh, regarding geopolitics, we talk about borders, we talk about territories, uh, we talk about how territories define uh, shape and reshape distribution of uh, power in the international system. And particularly, uh, you know, if that is state focused, we can understand that's a very positivist way of learning geopolitics. But we also have very significant post positivist understanding where human being is at the center where perhaps um, you know uh, the idea of border lands have emerged and which basically you know sometimes um, you know go beyond the traditional understanding of the security issues as well for example you know uh, the plight of the human being when we talk about cross-border migration and so on and so forth at the same time with a broadening and deepening of IR political science and security issues I think the scholarly writings of geopolitics has also 
spread it and broadened and deepened and incorporated various issues of um you know uh you know diversity whether it is the uh point of contact whether it is an individual human being whether it is uh about the methodology of learning the research inquiry for example if we talk about uh you know uh anthropological perspective more case studies and so on and so forth and therefore uh you know the plight of the human being migration those have become also very much significant issues in that and particularly if we talk about the issue called identity. So how borders have created the identities and particularly when we talk about uh, when we talk about South Asia and scholars have identified that it is not only post-colonial, it is also post-partition. Therefore, the, the emergence of the modern state in South Asia by the geopolitical scholars have received quite significant attention and it went beyond uh, you know just state to state relations so broadly broadly of course uh, we talk about mostly the realist theories traditional securities um you know halford mckinder alfred mahan as i was talking about it and and we have been you know mostly understanding the various uh, the significance of uh, you know powerful states in the region and how they have in fact, um, created or shaped the geopolitical understanding. And one cannot avoid the role of extraterritorial state or extra regional states, for example, China and the United States. And we would talk about it a little bit um, when I'll, you know, uh, 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 develop the, the understanding um, of Indo-Pacific versus Belt and Road Initiative um, offered by China. At the same time, on the positivist understanding, I think liberal theory of, um, you know, state to state co collaboration and cooperation regional collaborations have also received significant um interest among this scholarship that is basically rooted at um uh, that that basically rooted at um you know the idea of Kant's perpetual peace or even complex interdependence of uh the um you know different institutions um, and, um, you know, also jo John Eikenberry's understanding of liberal international order. But there has been serious critique, serious critique of, of the liberal international order, the understanding, the way how West has uh, kind of like proposed uh, as a global complex world order. Nevertheless, when we talk about the regional version of that, you know, there are ample questions that has been asked uh, you know, scholarly questions that has been posed regarding, um, you know, you know this uh, way. So, but the focus of this understanding, um, or or this particular lecture, or you know, the book that I've been talking about, uh, is more on identifying what are the critical theories and constructivists are imposed, and including the ideas of even the feminist geopolitics. So, the critical school in geopolitics have significantly been developed uh, in both Western and Eastern perspective. So geography, uh, according to one of the critical scholars, uh, critical theory scholar is basically a, not just a natural given power knowledge relationship, uh, sorry, naturally given, uh, you know, state to state relationship, but uh, there is an interesting understanding based on the construction of power based on the, uh, you know, paradigm or the discourse or the knowledge discourse over there. So unlike the realist thinker who treat border and space as objective reality, critical and postmodernist treat border and territoriality as a subjective phenomenon and that is uh, quite significantly depending on um, the political understanding, political gaze and lens, and also the power relationship between the states. Similarly, you know, constructivists have also significantly um, uh, uh, contributed in understanding uh, both, uh, you know, the geopolitical ideas of the Cold War era and at the same time, uh, the, the bridge between geopolitics and geoeconomics where you know, scholars like Ashish Nandis and others have significantly uh, uh, contributed in explaining how post-colonial um, uh, and at the same time, um, you know, post-colonial and at the same time post-partition cartographic anxiety, which has particularly been used by uh, a specific scholar and has been followed by others as well, um, created uh, or shaped the formation of, um, you know, 
regional geopolitics and its relations or particularly specific countries' relations with the extraterritorial states, for example, with the other powerful states from beyond the region. So this is quite interesting. And I think this literature has contributed in understanding, you know, is the criticality only rely on state to state relationship? Or there are other matters of construction um, and critical aspects that create the knowledge discourse regarding uh, the understanding. So in line, in line with that, feminist understanding as a very serious and you know, you know, quite significant um, uh, you know, uh, uh, part of, of broadly the critical school has also identified as like um as like other uh, branches of international relations, um, war studies or even strategic studies, geopolitics uh, is also uh, a very heteropatriarchal ideology. Uh, and at the same time, it talks about, you know, um, uh, uh, it talks about how, um, or it increases the, the, the structural nature of unequal uh, ness in the relationship and often the violent relationship between the borders, which is a reflection of the uh, the hierarchy um, um, and and all. So you know these are some of the theoretical understanding. But when 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 we are trying to imply this theoretical understanding on some of the very uh, important uh, or some of the selected important empirical issues on South Asia. I thought because of the time constraints and um, you know um, to to emphasize the discussion more, I would perhaps focus on three case studies. Or one is a very regional level, the other is more a bilateral level, and the third one is more a uh, human level or an individual level. So when we talk about um, you know um, uh, the the regional level and regional plus extra regional, so the example that I have in my mind is obviously, um, you know, what is happening on the South Asian uh, borderlands and the impact of uh, the uh, extra regional developmental projects. So that's one of the cases that I was thinking to, to, to discuss. But before that, I think you all understand that South Asia officially or unofficially uh, considers, um, you know, eight states. There were seven states previously, but Afghanistan was included. Uh, but we can also understand, you know, in different explanation, Afghanistan is also considered somewhere through, um, 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 uh, you know, some a, a very interesting kind of uh, region uh, in between uh, the the you know uh, Middle East and also uh, South Asia. Uh, but you know, because of its history uh, of you know, interventions by different powers, Afghanistan uh, has been considered as a very critical fault line of geopolitics when we talk about, um, when we talk about, um, you know, uh, the impact of, of global and regional geopolitics and uh, its significance on the country itself and the region. So Bangladesh, India, Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, and Maldives. So there are interesting diversities. Most of the countries have the colonial history and has faced the post-1947, that is post-partition kind of, you know, um, uh, um, complexities uh, uh, so far as, um, you know, the history is concerned. And it has, for many, uh, particularly for the critical geopolitics scholars and also constructivists, you know, the post-partitionness and the post-colonialism has been inherent in the um, exposure and the reflections of the foreign policy in the uh, in, in most of these countries, for example, Bhutan is a very small and locked country, but it is positioned in such a way between India and China, and therefore Doklam is a very important critical fault line which has experienced um, border disputes um, between India and China for long period of time. And there are allegations, there are um, kind of like, you know, uh, conversations uh, that whether Bhutan has an independent foreign policy or it is uh, um, uh, mostly dominated uh, by uh, the, the foreign policies of India and its neighborhood. Um, and similarly, you know, Maldives uh, has an election very recently and international media covered it in a way that says that a pro-Chinese prime uh, president has been elected defeating a pro-Indian uh, president. So that 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 kind of indicates that how even an island, a small nation, um, and 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 its election in recent times has been 
influenced by both regional and extra regional uh, kind of political um, uh, makeover. And that also says that how um, you know it it shapes the different kind of like borderlands. You know, it it's it's with Bangladesh, Nepal, and and of course you know we understand uh, the 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 uh, conventional power relationship between India and Pakistan, and also they share the border which has been partitioned in 1947. And um, you know that's why the scholars uh, one of the scholars say that you know it's uh, it's 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 kind of uh, it's kind of experiencing the cartographical anxiety along the line of these borderlands and which have an impact uh, not only on state to state relations, but also it shapes the relationship between the state and the people. So as I was saying, um, you know, um, the idea of borderlands, border territoriality are critical uh, points over here. Uh, so I'll not go into, you know, reading all the definitions. So uh, these are you know, of course, uh, with acknowledgement um, considered from um, or, you know, uh, borrowed from different scholarship. But, you know, based on the three levels of analysis, one is more a regional level, one is a bilateral level, and the other is an individual or human security level. I would try to kind of give you an uh, or share our thoughts that, you know, if we consider a very conventional uh, geopolitics, which is still very important, particularly as the power politics is still quite visible. But to understand the geopolitics uh, more in depth, I think, and we, those who have been working in this book project, we have been thinking that the, the alternative ideas would perhaps very uh, critical for us. Therefore, it is important for us to understand the, the criticality of borderlands, not only border as an objective reality, uh, and sometimes border, also create the otherness and that is the the reality uh, of the post-colonial South Asia that how borders has created uh, in fact significant uh, othering uh, among the people of the same village when the borders are imposed. Uh, territoriality and border spaces are also quite significant in that matter. So this is a quick map for for um, you know some of you who have not had the opportunity to see South Asian maps and its neighbors, uh, but I'm sure that you are very well aware because it's situated in a way which, um, you know, at, in the last couple of years, when we are talking about the rise of the understanding of the Indian Ocean, Bay of Bengal, and at the same time, uh, the standoffs that has been experienced in South China Sea. So, um, you know, apparently, a significant number of the South Asian geopolitics literature has somehow been, uh, you know, uh, at least in the last couple of years, who has been, um, you know, following this scholarship would probably experience that it has moved from land-based geopolitics to a more maritime-based geopolitics. And there are very fancy names in the Pacific and BRI and all that. And we will discuss shortly um, that, you know, uh, how, how those are very important. But at the same time, we have to understand that how we carry over the post-colonialness. That's also very much you know, um, important for us to understand. So we, the South Asia inherently as part of its post-partition, post-colonial geopolitical fate has uh, carried over the issues of Kashmir that we all understand. So India, Pakistan, bilateral issue on the, um, you know, uh, areas of Kashmir, Jammu and Kashmir, we all understand that half of it uh, uh, is administered by India and the half, the rest of the half is administered by Pakistan. It's an still unresolved issue. And it has been, um, um, you know, expanded in various other ways. Um, and both these countries have fought wars, conventional wars, mm. you know, uh, with with each other quite a few times, uh, which is not exactly on the same front always, but the impact of that dispute has, um, you know, exemplified uh, quite significantly. India and China has their own border disputes as well, at least um, in two or more than two areas. 
Um, uh, so that's also quite significant. Uh, one is again in the Kashmir uh, region and the other is on the Urunachal region on farther north. Um, so both these countries have fought one one conventional war, but they have had uh, multiple experiences of border skirmishes uh, and and several um, you know lands which are alternatively claimed by each other as their own. Uh, therefore, that kind of um, you know indicates that uh, you know even after so many years, um, it has not been solved. If you look at the the land disputes along the line of the Duran line, which is Pakistan and Afghanistan, is another very interesting story um, with Nepal and India, with India and Bangladesh, with Bhutan keeping in between between India and China. So there are um, unfortunate but fascinating uh, kind of diverse um, you know patterns of disputes once if one would like to really look at uh, what are the natures of the territorial disputes. Now, the question is, as a student of international relations or geopolitics, will you be interested to only study those as a bilateral crisis? Or would you like to see or apply more critical theories and see how the borderlands have grown with the fault lines, with the histories of post-partition in this particular area? So this is another picture that shows, um, and in fact, the Duran line, MacMahon line, you know, all those lines are basically uh, the colonial construction uh, and the borders that were drawn uh, from in, in the decade of uh, uh, in, in mid 20th century, um, um, you know, at the peak of uh, the departure of the colonial rulers, um, has kind of carry forwarded with the uh, with the forms of different conflicts. So that is one way of looking at it, conflict, geopolitics, state-to-state -state relations. But is that the only thing? Now, quite interestingly, if you look at this map and now impose uh, the, uh, so this is basically quite a fast forward. Now, if you impose the idea of Belt and Road Initiative, uh, and then you can come back with the idea of, um, you know, what is, the counter approaches to Belt and Road initiatives imposed by China, that would be quite fascinating as well. So one idea is if you apply the liberal schools of geopolitics, that would be, of course, you know, kind of providing legitimacy that how China is trying to encircle with its development projects and connecting um, in a, both Asia, Africa and Europe to a large extent. So um, but at the same time, of course, uh, the nature of the country, its political history, its relationship are important variables. In fact, with, even within, if you are trying to apply the liberal geopolitical mat, uh, you know, models and try to see if the cooperation will flourish and kind of have a trickle down impact on the other countries or regions who have just been part of this, uh, you know, initiative that is um, kind of initiated by a single country, China an emerging economic power, already a very powerful economic power and at the, at the same time military power as well. But China, um, you know, why do China do that? Very, you know, briefly, just to give you a reminder, I'm sure that you all know it very well, that they are also thinking about the rising U.S. influence in the region, uh, you know, cutting down or decreasing, you know, American military security and partnership agreements, uh, particularly with Japan and South Korea are very important. Uh, financial interests uh, in the entire maritime base order is also very significant for China. So apparently, you know, the, these arguments, or even if you bring the arguments of, um, you know, countering the military uh, 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 kind of like, you know, um, power of the United States or the rest of the West, uh, I think both falls into a very positivist understanding of the geopolitics, which is which is kind of okay. So we we understand that, you know, what are the major points of China to increase these borderlands. Now, quite interestingly, there are two transformations. Number one, the land-based borders has been transformed into maritime borders. And maritime borders are also geophysical entity, but at the same time, one has to understand it these are also lively land. So when China went to build a port in Hambantota, 
And we all know the story of Chinese Sri Lankan, uh, you know, investment patterns and Sri Lanka went bankrupt and there were issues. Sri Lanka is recovering. You know, then the issues come for other South Asian countries. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. So you have to diversify your investment. Simple liberal economic models of trade and investment. But of course, you know, China, and that's a different story. We shouldn't go probably in details into that, that to what extent they come with so many resources compared to the Western partners. So sometimes it becomes a dilemma for the, some, some of the South Asian countries not to say or to say no to Chinese offers. That's completely different. But, but I think the important point is, or the question is, uh, so China's maritime interests, as some scholars have identified, are not only based on liberal geopolitical model, we all understand. So if you bring the conventional geopolitical model, you can see that there are some convergences, but mostly divergences of interest with the West. Uh, and as a result of that, I think if you stretch the South China Sea dispute in the Indo-Pacific or Bay of Bengal, because I live close to Bay of Bengal, that's my shore, so that's my concern. I think that says that you know, there might be some points of disputes, even though the ball is in the court of some of the South Asian littoral countries like us, Bangladesh, that how we do the balance between BRI and in the Pacific. The question comes in that, is this competition perhaps better understood, uh, better understood from the conventional geopolitical models, but at the same time, it also raises question that are we going back to a very Cold War geopolitics model in South Asia at this moment? That has also been discussed by many scholars. There are debates and you know, conferences and seminars that if the, the dispute in the South China Sea is extended over till the Bay of Bengal, um, but obviously the, 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 the partners are completely different. There, 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 there is India, of course, having a very in a bittersweet relationship with with China, mostly, you know, there are many issues over there. There's a Pakistan with Pakistan. China has a very significant uh, maritime project called China Pakistan Economic Corridor with Myanmar, uh, and China is obviously trying to improve its, you uh, know, kind of like you know, uh, creating more offer for Bangladesh as well as the, along the same line. So the question comes in now: if you impose uh, because the territorial disputes are still there, the previous the first map that I show, but on top of that map, if you impose this map of BRI, the question comes in that whether the kind of like a mixture or a juxtaposition of the realist and liberalist model together work over here, or we need uh, the other understanding in this regard. So that was my first case. And I know I probably have a little bit of 10, 11 minutes. Um, uh, so I will try to um, switch over to the next case, which is the bilateral issues. But the argument here on, on this issue is, if you juxtapose the, the trade, the, 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 the conventional and existing border disputes and create uh, and impose uh, a, a liberal kind of, um, you know, connectivity project imposed by or offered by an extra regional states, and there are other counter uh, you know, interest over there. Um, so, which I was talking about, uh, particularly the counter offer in the case of uh, BRI is, of course, in the Pacific and particularly Quad. So, to what extent that will create uh, stability will be a question, because I'm, you know, you know, I'm not. Gener we are not generating a conclusion. the The point is. If you try to look at it from a geopolitics that leads towards a very stable um, security situations over there, uh, incorporating um, you know developments and all that, will perhaps be a little bit uh, problematic. So there are um, arguments that you know what is the West position, and officially, both China and West is perhaps avoiding the terminologies that indicates that there is a tug of war, like a cold war between Soviet, former Soviet Union and, and United States. But it seems like, it seems like that Bay of Bengal or broadly the Indian Ocean will perhaps be a very important and critical area of, um, you know, tussle, if I would, a very uh, moderate war in that uh, way or if not conflict. So it's it's not only confined towards the trade conflict between these two big regions. So of course, uh, that is one way. 
of looking at it. But let's go back to the bilateral issues that we have. So the bilateral issues, as we have been seeing, I think one of the critical bilateral issues that defines the nature of geopolitics and particularly India-Pakistan relations is, um, is, of course, Kashmir. Now, historically, in the textbooks of this region, and mostly by uh, non-South Asian scholars and South Asian scholars, Kashmir has been seen as an India-Pakistan issue. That's a very statist geopolitics. But there are, in the recent times, scholars who tried to show that, you know, the borderlands of Leh, Ladakh, and um, Muzaffarnagar, Srinagar, you know, Kargil as the uh, line of control, which is not an actual border between India and Pakistan, has serious stories, very critical stories, which uh, can be part of the human geography, the 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 the, the victimhoods and 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 significant other, uh, you know, you know, stories, which is not just the story that state generates. For example, the if you look at the Indian narratives. Uh, you know, Pakistan, of course, in failed trades, uh, there are allegations. If, if you look at the Pakistan narratives of India, there are counter logics, um, which is very much statist. But, you know, the conflict over Kashmir is not only an India-Pakistan conflict at this moment. It's It, it inc incorporates, you know, insurgency, terrorism, and various other issues. But at the same time, one has to also think that for what reason how there are organic in-house uh, insurgencies that have emerged in the Indian side of Kashmir, India being a democratic country and considered, you know, they have provided a uh, uh, special status to Kashmir for long, long years until, it, uh, until unless it was repealed in 2000, I think before, just before Corona 2019 or earlier 2020. Um, so this figure is basically uh, a figure of an Kashmiri Indian, Burhan Wani, who was killed in 2016, uh, by the Indian security agencies, but the the last rituals in the last rituals of these persons, there were million people who marched and say uh, that there will be more Burhan Wali. I think that was a very tension moment for the state that this guy is not from Pakistan. So how come and for what reasons the state has created a mechanism uh, for long years, despite Kashmir had a special status? How the organic um, you know, protests and, and insurgency view in a country. So, of course, one has to look at, or state has to look at, that what are, what has been wrong uh, in dealing with Kashmir as well. So, you know, transforming the India-Pakistan bilateral understanding of the Kashmir issue towards a very own uh, organic uh, understanding of the rise of insurgency in a particular state is very interesting. And Northeast India is another way, because of the time constraint, we cannot go into that. So non-registers of the citizens uh, in Asham was applied. Very interesting case uh, to understand the borderlands because Asham is very close to Bangladesh. Asham is a state of India. And before Corona, uh, I think the COVID pandemic, um, you know, Indian government suddenly thought that as there was an issue of Bengali infiltration in Assam, so they should apply a kind of, an identification of its citizenship in Assam to find out who has been uh, the original Indian citizens. And after doing that, they have found uh, that a significant number, which is beyond their imagination, could not even provided all the documents that they needed to prove uh, perhaps a 70-year-old person after so many years of living in India is now compelled to submit all the documents to prove that he or she is an Indian citizen at this moment. And a significant number of Hindu citizens were found in, of having lack of their papers, non-citizens of, of India. So Indian government at that moment was quite embarrassed and stopped this NRC to be applied in the other provinces. Now, what is, why would it was very critical for Bangladesh being a very neighboring region to Assam? Because what will happen of those who will not be identified as the citizen of India and after some time if they were pushed back to Bangladesh? And of course, most of them were in religion by religion Muslim. So this is quite interesting. Apparently, Bangladesh and India being a very friendly country, this particular you know project of identifying who is a citizen or who is a not after seventy five years of independence could have created a very uh, critical 
geopolitical or border issues between India and Bangladesh. Thankfully, because of COVID pandemic and what results they have found in Assam was quite unexpected for them, it was yet not applied to other states or could have created an issue uh, with others. So um, Afghanistan is another issue I think you know, we can discuss it 30 more minutes, but I'll not go into that. But after this bilateral India-Pakistan issue or India-Bangladesh issue, I think my last point was the human factor. And I think when we talk about South Asia at this moment, we should not uh, ignore or avoid the Rohingya issue or the population movement issue, involuntary movement issue. I'm sure that you all understand or all know, uh, you know that, that a large scale of Rohingya exodus has taken place in 2017. And um, you know, Bangladesh at this moment has been hosting uh, roughly 1.1 million Rohingyas, including the ones that came in 2000, uh, 2017. And also there were a few before. Now, this is not only a Bangladesh-Myanmar issue. This is also a Bangladesh-Myanmar and India issue because Rohingyas usually come to Bangladesh. Some of them go to India, but there are also people from other ethnicity who went to, for example, Kachin, Karen, Shans, and others who, because of the border conflicts between Myanmar junta governments and, um, you know, um, the the armed groups, they also migrate to 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 India as well. Some parts of India as well, but particularly Rohingyas in large scale migrate to. Bangladesh. Now, what is their next step or what is their next stop? As we all can understand in the case of involuntary migration, the people who come uh, and, and initially a large number of people usually go to a place next to their home. So Bangladesh is obviously the first target, but they do not stop always. They are traveling maybe in a small number and gradually the number has been increasing. Uh, what we call them as boat migrants. It's kind of like an um, you know, replication of, of the Syrian migrants using the Mediterranean towards the Europe. But at the same time, the 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 Rohingyas are also interested to travel through the Mandaman, uh, Bay of Bengal and Andaman Sea and to go to um, you know, um, Malaysia, Indonesia, and some of them were also found in Thailand as well. So this is not a new phenomenon. This is an ongoing one because there has been the decades, there has been the issues of um, human smuggling. But when uh, there is a large chunk of vulnerable people living in the camp area, which is exactly on the shore, very close to the shore, um, if you want to look at the 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 map on the top of this slide, where it is mentioned that you know at the shore of the Bay of Bengal, the majority of the uh, camps are basically situated over there. The camps where the Rohingyas are living in Bangladesh at this moment. But this is. These from these camps, there is a significant number of people, and which is increasing, are planning and traveling to use the sea or boats to go to. Um, of course, it's a very risky affair, but this is something that has been happening as well. And what does it talk about? Um, uh, can we understand these issues, the plight of the involuntary migrations through um, in a conventional understanding? Perhaps not. Uh, the situations of Rohingyas are very complex, and as I was telling, that it is not only impacting on uh, the relations between the two countries or maybe three including India but it's a very regional one because the engagement of China is very interesting their relationship with Myanmar you know Bangladesh is still insisting on the full repatriation safe and sustainable repatriation but we can understand as like many other involuntary cases of involuntary migration this is perhaps one of the reasons um, uh, this is not perhaps the most uh, you know, usable option at this moment because if you consider Myanmar's options, is very, uh, is very difficult. So many would suggest that if you apply the constructivist lens, you would probably understand, uh, you know, how the borderlands in this particular area, along with the shore, is is working over there. Now you just think of it that in Myanmar, in Rakhine State, China has invested significant amount of resources as part of its uh, China-Myanmar economic cooperation. And at the same time, very close to that place, there is a huge amount of probably the fifth largest refugee camp that has been, um, you know, uh, that has been there. So this would probably be a very interesting um, methodological approach to think about that. What kind of model would you like to apply to that? So finally, I think in the conclusion, after these three examples, which was quite hastily presented, I'm quite sure, but, you know, if it kind of phrases any 
um, understanding or you know maybe some questions that you probably have or discussions that we can do is are the theories still relevant, the geopolitical theories? Because at one point of time, when Fukuyama was talking about the end of the history after the Cold War, many would think that perhaps, um, you know, the end of Mackinder and end of Mahan, um, those are the facts. But, you know, many are quite a significant number of scholars are basically thinking with BRI and Indo-Pacific tussle that whether Mahan is coming back with the re-emergence of sea and the marine competitions and all that, marine-based, you know, maritime-based order. So great power relations, Indo-Pakistan relations, you know, terrorism, um, border issues, uh, regional cooperations of the failure are still there. And perhaps the realist and liberalist logics are still very significant. And particularly when we talk about you know, collaboration, cooperation, um, you know, even in the border, uh, when we talk about energy trade, which is a significant issue at this moment, you would also be interested to apply liberal understanding. But the issue is, uh, can we really understand um, the securitization of borders through realist understanding or state to state understanding? The Kashmir case that I was, you know, trying to build up on, or, you know, the NRC case in Asham, where or even the way how uh, the Rohingya people were made stateless in 1982 law, a state law, which has happened in Sri Lanka as well, the way how the Indian Tamils were made non-citizens and that led to an armed struggle with LTT and Sri Lankan government ended in a military solution in 2009. So there are ample examples where if you'd like to dig into deep, I think uh, you may be more comfortable or you may find it more plausible to use... Um, uh, the the critical uh, the critical schools of the constructivist lens, uh, particularly the understanding of territoriality, borderlands, not only the border as well. The last food for thought is, and this is a very growing and interesting uh, you know area in geopolitics that has been emerging in the last um, uh, at least more than a decade. Uh, with the understanding of Anthropocene and the use of the idea of Anthropocene uh, in geopolitics and IR. Uh, because, of course, after the recent COVID pandemic, people are more conscious, if not conscious, more cautious about, um, you know, the climate change and the, you know, there are, there are, it might sound a little bit as a conspiracy, but, you know, many would say that next pandemic would probably come because of the melting of the glaciers. Um, you know, I hope that that shouldn't be the case. But it's true that South Asia and the countries are also climate vulnerable countries. And there are issues of involuntary migrations, maybe in a small number, but have the potentiality of uh, of being in, in, in a huge number in future that, you know, how, uh, you know, the, the climate refugees, the climate, the impacts of the climate change, uh, and particularly the very uh, human made disasters uh, can create more uh, in a hierarchy or ordering and ordering processes, uh, which is, I guess, a very interesting um, lens to look at the geopolitics in addition to the statist understanding. So I would stop here and um, would be happy to uh, discuss a little bit more if there are any questions or observations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, I apologize uh, for this technical hiccups on my side, but uh, you know, this artificial intelligence uh, started to, to know to actually command me, not I command artificial intelligence. Uh, this uh, the, also about Anthropocene and the, the future of the humankind exactly. thank you thank you very much thank you thank you very much indeed for 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 this uh, for this comprehensive uh, presentation I, I i really appreciate that you you find the time and you you presented it from the the, the different different angle uh, which which we, here in europe we 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 uh, we look at it um, from from uh, from from our perspective, certainly is a, is a very very interesting case of of this the bordering and borders, and 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 uh, I, I I as far as a member also you you have also the 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 the, the special special arrangements between India and Bangladesh when you have the 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 uh, enclaves of of the of of uh, Bangladeshi territory inside India. 
and enclaves of, of Indian territory inside Bangladesh. And this also very, very unique, uh, unique um, application of, of this also of bordering and borders and the, the, the concept of, of, of the national territories, uh, flexibility and understanding to, to, to all the, all the, all the contexts and all the, all the, uh, complexity you, you also presented today. Thank you. So, so, uh, now we can, uh, we can have, uh, uh, we can now ask uh, our students uh, for the questions. Ladies, gentlemen, please raise your hands. Don't be afraid. <laughs> it's a, it's a complex, a complex, uh, very, co very complex, complex uh, topic, but but uh, still very uh, at the same time very interesting. And uh, our guest is open for for your questions. Maybe I will start with the question. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. It was very, very complex and very, very interesting to know your perspective of the geopolitics. I would like to ask you about French influences in South Asia, because the French is a very important game player in the region. And could you please uh, explain us uh, your perspective about this topic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a historian, but whenever we want to talk about uh, French influence in South Asia, one has to definitely um, go back to uh, at least 17th, 16th centuries, particularly uh, there was an interesting, um, um, you know, in a tussle or uh, relationship between uh, the two colonies at that time, French and British. And there were significant presence of both French and Portuguese, but particularly, uh, you know, the main tussle was between the, the, uh, the, the British East India Company, um, as well as the French business businessmen um you know uh, who were there and kind of there were there are several understandings regarding the division of who do the business in where in the indian subcontinent before partition so as you can understand it was all together india pakistan bangladesh uh, nepal particularly so uh, that history is quite significant and therefore you know still you know, there were some areas particularly in the indian side at this moment where uh, the french uh, presence uh, is, is still there as as particularly co in a communities but of course we understand it very well that particularly after 1750 uh, i think you know yeah 1757 i'm i'm all, i always screwed up with the year um so gradually the british rule was consolidated and it started with bengal because when uh, in 1757 at the uh, the it, it's known in the history books as the battle of palasi where the king of bengal was defeated by lord clive and, and that was kind of the official beginning of the British East India Company. And they parallelly fought with the mercenaries of the French businessmen as well. And so gradually with the mid 18th century, uh, it was quite clear that British colony has been more consolidated in there. Now to jump um, in a significantly fast forward towards the 20th century or the 21st century, I think um, it, it's true that with France, I think it's mostly the the business, political, and cultural relationship. I can talk about um, a little bit. I'm, I'm, you know, I have followed the the defense deals. Of course, that is one of my area of interest broadly under the security and cooperation. But at the same time, um, in a, for example, you know, French and India collaboration regarding the procurement of the Rafale is has been one of the very significant issues and it has created some controversies in the Indian internal politics as well regarding the deal, the defense procurement, one of the issues. So yes, France role um, in particularly high value goods procurement is very important, particularly when we are talking about um, defense uh, procurements. Recently, French president, uh, I think two months before, uh, made a very short visit to Bangladesh as well in my country. And there were 
you know, good media presence, uh, analysis. Um, it was a very good gesture, but there are also discussion perhaps, uh, um, you know, there were, uh, there were few deals to be waiting uh, at that moment, uh, particularly regarding defense and, uh, and, 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 and more, you know, scientific products and so on and so forth. But at the same time, I think on a very lighter note, but which is very important that I, as, as I belong to a more, you know, non-statist critical school of thoughts in IR, I think, you know, the role of uh, Alia's process is very important. Uh, the, uh, uh, it's, it's promoting culture, you know, language learning and encouraging students for higher education in France. I think this is there, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the center is there in India in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, and in many other countries, and they have long been working significantly uh, on improving people-to-people -people relations, you know, exchange, culture, encouraging the learning of the French language, and so on and so forth. It might be at the state level, if you compare is, uh, you know, that might be a little bit um, not at the same par when we talk about high politics versus low politics, but the role of, um, you know, Olias Francis and uh, you know uh, this kind of institution is is quite significant as well, um, but I think on the other hand, as we have been anglophone, uh, mostly not anglophone. I think you know I'd be I'd perhaps be criticized by my own peers by using a very um, colonial word, but you know as we have been um, you know post colonial but ruled by the the the, the Britishers for a long time, I think the significance of or the level of um, you know the influence of the United Kingdom was quite significant at one point of time. But later on, I think you know when we consider the the Cold War politics and particularly uh, after the two thousand one nine eleven. Uh, the U.S. politics in South Asia, and if you consider the recent what I think I took the most of the time in discussing the Belt and Road Initiative and Chinese influence, so those have become quite significant um, if you make a comparative analysis of um, extra-regional powers and its influence on South Asia. Thank you very much. It's, uh, yes, it's uh, really the... the... The, the France France is uh, the France role is is also very very interesting because because as a as the only on, only only country of the European Union uh, uh, France is a member of the Indian Ocean uh, Regional Association uh, and also other 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 regional institutions and this like from uh, it, it provides uh, France uh, insights uh, different different from the from other European Union Union uh, Union countries. Uh, for the and what what about what about uh, uh, what about the 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 geo geopolitics geopolitics uh, and and inter interaction interrelation between between uh, countries of South Asia and Southeast Asia within the Bay of Bengal, because it's also for us, it's interesting uh, because we, we the only, only the, the institutionalized uh, uh, phenomenon we, we, we witness, it's uh, BIMSTEC, yes? I mean, there's the Bay right. of Bengal, Bay of Bengal Technical Cooperation Organization. But are there, are there any 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 other let's say the institutional or bilateral model or minilateral uh, co cooperation just and, and reaching this this uh, geo geopolitical perspective uh, between uh, south and southeast? Thank you. I think uh, this is one of the areas where um, you know the developments or improvements. Uh, can only be traced if you look at it a very state to state collaboration uh, between uh, the South Asian countries and Southeast Asian countries. Now, the famous or uh, you know actist policy. Uh, previously, it was a Lukist policy. Then, when the Narendra Modi government uh, came into power, they they kind of like you know renamed the policy and called uh, actist policy. Um, was something uh, that was a more visible move towards the. Uh, east of 
the South Asia and particularly India. And, uh, you know, Bangladesh and others have also, uh, particularly I can talk about Bangladesh, that Bangladesh has also emphasized quite significantly to improve its bilateral relations with the nations of Southeast uh, Asia and also Far East Asia. So, for example, with, um, of course, Japan has always been a very significant development partner uh, with China. The, the volume of trade has increased quite significantly in the last uh, one, uh, you know, more than one decade. So, Along with that, I think the one thing that, um, you know, um, um, I think South Asian countries, um, you know, well, you know, it's difficult to generalize, but, you know, there are different, for example, India has a uh, um, um, uh, more significant relationship with the Southeast Asian countries and also with ASEAN as well. In compared to that, I think the other countries in, in, in South Asia has not really been uh, part of a formal mechanism except BIMSTEC, which you have mentioned. Now, you know, this is an interesting trans-regional formation which have uh, some countries of South Asia and some others from Southeast Asia, but mostly very statist in nature. Therefore, you know, the critiques of such kind of regional arrangements have always said that it has sometimes been confined or the functionality of these organizations are confined often with the annual summits or you know the 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 summits but yeah this is something which is important and it has one of the ways um, you know to begin uh, uh, the connectography between these two regions but you know the questions are whether uh, you know, these organizations needs an organic expansion as well. For example, the way how BRICS has been exp um, expanded after so many discussions and all that. Yes, um, you know, for example, we have individual, uh, you know, if we talk about Bangladesh's relations with uh, the other countries, of course, uh, Singapore is an important um, hub for business and increasing the service industries. Uh, there are a lot of room to develop the relationship and expand expanding the relationship as well. With Indonesia, we have exchanges on different levels, particularly with defense collaborations, you know, peacekeeping forces and all that. Um, you know, Indonesia and Malaysia, both these countries, because of the, um, you know, uh, uh, similarities on the basis of religions, have always been very vocal in the ASEAN forum uh, against Myanmar. Uh, particularly when, uh, you know, the discussion was going on how, um, um, you know, uh, the exodus of the Rohingyas has happened and military uh, were repressive, uh, repressive enough, um, in fact, to, to create this forced migration in the Arakan region of Myanmar. But, you know, there are again, you know, there are own political complexities with Man with, within ASEAN as well. Therefore, um, you know, Myanmar was expelled once, but um, at the same time, uh, it um, was again kind of reinstated in 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 ASEAN. Uh, so there were supporters of um, you know the Rohingyas within their own formats, and which has created uh, or you know opened up opportunities uh, for collaboration between Bangladesh and and particularly Indonesia and Malaysia. But you know um, you know there are a lot of rooms to 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 develop, and at least. Um, you know, I can see like, you know, based on the maritime order and the way how uh, there is a tendency to define uh, the the maritime issues, um, collaborations between the countries. Of course, um, um, all the literal states of South Asia and Southeast Asia has uh, or should um, expand their relationship more in future as well. Not only confined um, in between state-based uh, regional organizations. Thank you. Now we have now we have a, a question from from the student. Uh, what about what about uh, Bangladesh and South Asia and and uh, your your opinion and position on on, on uh, Hamas, uh, okay. Israel and Palestine? How it's the the the, the recent developments? Right. Um, I mean, right. Um, so there, there is no regional kind of uh, response or collective response to that. I can talk about Bangladesh's response. Uh, I can talk about um, uh, a little bit about India's response as well. Um, um, I have not been following, but of course, Pakistan has their own um, kind of responses as well. Uh, but let me, I mean, you know, Bangladesh, um, 
or the response that Bangladesh has, uh, you know, officially been given uh, after the recent uh, conflict in Israel and Hamas, uh, that has a historical base because Bangladesh is one of the countries which uh, officially does not recognize um, Israel. So I think, you know, is the only country uh, where, um, as of now, where we do not have um, a diplomatic relations. And that is in the honor of, um, you know, standing beside the the uh, the Palestinian people. And historically, I mean, this is since the birth of Bangladesh as an independent country in 1971. Um, so this has an impact, of course, broadly, um, impact on the sense that, um, you know, uh, what is the relationship of, uh, Bangladesh with the Western countries and it's also very important because we have been struggling to have uh, we have been struggling um, um, you know because of the national elections and the nature of the election and it's non-acceptability by some countries particularly um, you know United States and United Kingdom both of the countries have given uh, their own um, kind of uh, opinion um, just yesterday um, a day after our national elections and it's not exactly very positive towards the government who have been re-elected uh, fourth time uh, consecutively. Um, therefore, the the internal politics and the relationship between, um, uh, 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 for example, Bangladesh and, and 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 the United States is also influenced and kind of like you know um, by the position that Bangladesh has quite explicitly taken, uh, not exactly for Hamas but for the general. Uh, uh, you know, citizens and victims of of the uh, the Palestine uh, at this moment. India has a very um, because India is uh, India and Israel relations are very very good uh, based on you know trade relations and all that. So um, that's also something that um, you know India has to consider. But at the same time, India has also condemned uh, the 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 the, the, uh, the acts um, which has created uh, victims, particularly the the hospital case, if I remember correctly, at that moment. But India has to play that balanced role because uh, the India-Israel relationship and um, considering India's relationship with other Western countries as well. Um, but at the same time, India has also been historically um, uh, a supporter of the two-state solutions between uh, between uh, between uh, uh, Palestine uh, and and Israel at that moment. So it's it's a little bit complicated in that situation, and it's also impacting its relations with the other Western countries, particularly you know United States as 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 U.S. role um, it depends on uh, what particular aspects you have been following uh, uh, has also been criticized of 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 being supportive of of Israel's uh, hawkish policies vis-a-vis vis-a-vis there were also praiseworthy terms when President Biden of the United States has actually condemned and requested and those which went in favor of um, uh, the civilian victims of Palestine so so it's uh, uh, it's quite complex in that particular situation there was another hand um, if you still want to ask the question. Yeah, yes, Edward. Mr. Edward, Mr. Edward, please ask the question. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, uh, I wanted to ask a question about the history of which uh, occurred between and uh, between Bangladesh and uh, Myanmar, the fact was the moment uh, when uh, Bangladesh itself uh, got uh, independence in 1971, because uh, 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 this uh, uh, hard uh, situation with the minority of uh, Rakhine on the territory of uh, Myanmar uh, is being actual since uh, the moment when uh, generally uh, British uh, India uh, stopped uh, its uh, existence uh, and uh, got uh, 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 re re reformed uh, towards uh, the states of um, Burma, uh, Pakistan and uh, India. Uh, so I want to to ask the question, what was uh, the relationship, the history of the relationships uh, between the ba Bangladesh and uh, Myanmar since de facto, let's say it's so 19, 
48, nine, and um, some details about uh, uh, its um, uh, its occurrence. Like for example, attitude of Bangladesh uh, to the NOD uh, elections in 1990, uh, to the uprising of 1988, or to uh, uh, to the dictatorship which occurred since the moment when uh, socialists, uh, de facto communists, were uh, overthrown uh, in uh, 1988 and uh, established a new um, uh, government of junta, which uh, uh, which had been taking uh, its power uh, in their hands until uh, 2015 and uh, returned to the power uh, four years ago and generally. Uh, what is uh, the relation uh, of uh, Bangladesh uh, uh, officials uh, to the civil war which is occurring uh, right now in Myanmar? Uh, do they uh, realize uh, support to some uh, additional groups uh, besides Rohingya uh, in the struggle? Thank you very much. Hey. I finished. Thank you, Mr. Edward. Um, uh, Quite a set of complex questions, of course, and I also thank um, um, Michelle uh, for the questions uh, that you have asked on the Israel and Hamas. Um, um, so um, I think, you know, that's quite interesting. And again, the colonial relationship of identifying and marking the borders and creation of the new state in the period of 1947, 48 and 49 is quite significant. and carry forward the legacy, the point that I was trying to make when I was talking about Kashmir, the bilateral issue between India and Pakistan, is also applied in the case of Myanmar, particularly in the state of Arakan, particularly in identifying not only Rohingya, but also three or four other scheduled uh, non-state uh, groups of people who were made non-state in the 1982 Citizenship Act of Myanmar. But what has happened between 48 and 82? So 48 and 82, all those close near, nearly four decades, Rohingyas were completely the citizens of Myanmar. And even when in the decade of 60s, when uh, Myanmar went into a complete military rule, even after that, for more than two decades, Rohingyas were the citizens of Myanmar. So, you know, Rohingyas were the medium of Bangladesh-Myanmar relations more on a social and individual perspective. And that's what it is very important for us to understand, you know, going beyond the status discourses. So you have to bring, uh, you know, a, a human being at the center and you have to bring, uh, you know, the critical theories or apply the critical theories and also uh, the constructivist theories or sometimes feminist theories to understand geopolitics as well. The question comes in that, you know, what has happened from 82 onwards and why Rohingya? So it might be, the question might be absolutely a repression based on a very, you know, you know significant repression uh, conducted by the military rulers uh, on uh, the particular minority of the Rohingyas. And you can also bring about the discussions that how Arakan was utilized or planned to be utilized for mega projects and so on and so forth. There are many conspiracy theories that why why the Rohingyas were expelled from their land in 2016 because of the series of repression that has taken place. The question is Bangladesh-Myanmar relations, which is a very important relations. Bangladesh, and it's again, um, if you if you explain it, from the colonial geopolitical perspective that Bangladesh is, as India is the largest country and a continental state in this South Asia. So all the India's neighborhood is actually occupied, not only academically, but practically in the policy level to discuss about the, or to fix the relationship with India and country X, for example, Bangladesh and India. So somehow or other, Myanmar was always um, you know, not very significantly considered, although Myanmar is our second land neighbor, except the another sea neighbor that we have is the Bay of Bengal. Now, why I'm saying this, I might be, um, you know, uh, counter-argued by many scholars, but we haven't really invested enough scholarship or policy understanding how to 
you know, understand the relationship between Bangladesh and Myanmar historically. They are both friendly. Bangladesh and Myanmar are friendly countries. They are still friendly countries. And even after the 2022 military coup, the immediately after uh, Victory Day celebration of Myanmar, Myanmar invited three or four countries to be the guest in their Victory Day celebration. And Bangladesh as a neighbor, India as a neighbor were invited. And both these countries participated. Despite we have been hosting 1.1 million Rohingyas, who we call the citizens of Myanmar. And Myanmar does not agree or acknowledge that they are the citizens of Myanmar. So I think, you know, this is the complexity of geopolitics. And again, you know, the post-colonial factor is very important and, and, and the post-partition factor that, you know, the countries can, even after 70 years, can take a litmus test of identifying who is a citizen, who is a not. And therefore, and therefore, they make some people non-citizen, which creates more problem which goes cross-border or trans-border. So that is the beginning of, of this. So um, there were quite a few questions I can understand. And you you are, I mean, I, 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 I kind of felt that you are, you have been reading the Myanmar history quite significantly. After, with the civil war, we didn't have an official statement. What we have said, the government of Bangladesh has said that it has to be stopped. And because in some cases, the heat of the civil war has also been felt in the border areas of Cox's Bazar, Ukiya, and Teknaf. Except those areas, and except the thought that the civil war would perhaps make the repatriation issue of the Rohingyas more difficult, that is the concern that Bangladesh government is currently thinking of. But still, there are some level of conversation going on, keeping China as the mediator in between Myanmar and Bangladesh for safe and sustainable repatriation of the Rohingyas. Uh, but the way how we thought it would be resolved has been taking a long time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Yes, the Rohingya. Uh, yes, uh, Claudia Del Grande, please uh, go ahead with your question. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I wanted to ask um, about uh, what about the climate change? What can if, if we have some evidence right now or if we can imagine some output? Uh, of the uh, pressure of climate change in in the geopolitics of this South Asia area, because I truly don't know, so I'm I'm curious. I would like to to ask this question. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think you know um, I'm I'm not also an expert on climate change, particularly on the scientific aspects that, of course, deals with a lot of evidence-based understanding. Um, but yes, this debate is there that, for example, the St. Martin Island, the coral reef island that we have in the Bay of Bengal, which is within the Bangladesh's geography, but a separate island, there were, there were, there were you know, kind of like uh, suspicion that it might uh, submerge completely um, by 2030 or some scientists say 2040. So we have to still wait to see to what extent that would go because of the rise of the sea level. But if you consider the other indicators of the climate change, for example, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of like uh, the, 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 the measurement of the rainfalls over the years, so, and the incre increase of the desertified areas in the entire South Asia region. Second, the shortages of the uh, sweet water or the drinking water sources, um, you know, unplanned urbanization, uh, the number of the earthquake, which again is a very debatable issue that whether it is an anthropocenic or man-made disaster or is a natural disaster. But when you make um, you know, a huge amount of unplanned urbanization, high-rise buildings without plans and so on and so forth, um, I think that would have significant impact when a uh, minimum level of Richter scale of earthquake takes place as well. So if you also count that number and if you also count the uh, air quality, um, um, you know, I think South Asia hosts three, at least three cities I know, both uh, Karachi in Pakistan, New Delhi in India, Mumbai a little bit as well, and Dhaka in Bangladesh. All these countries are at the lower level of the air quality. You know, if you travel here, I would encourage you to travel here. This is a fascinating country, but you have to also take care if you are really conscious about air quality and your inhalation. Um, Ambassador Thomas was here for a long time, I know, and I'm sure that, you know, has kind of like, uh, and that's a pre-COVID era, so we were more courageous, I'm sure. Uh, the generation has changed perhaps after COVID, but, you know, those are the issues. And now the, the argument that Anthropocene 
and the scholars would like to bring here is that that you as a policymaker, if you are a policymaker, you have the option to securitize and over securitize some of these issues. For example, um, you know, there was an um, I'm talking about like early 20th century and there was an interesting relationship between Bangladesh and India and India always alleged that from its southwest, from Bangladesh's southwest, because of desertification, people will migrate and illegally cross the border towards India for livelihood. Although India didn't really have a significant number of evidence, but there might be, you know, some small cases, but those was an issue. So climate vulnerability and climate-led migration can also be utilized to kind of create a shape between two countries to neighboring countries as well, which might not always be the case that um, it brings, uh, you know, good relationship between the two countries. Um, so I think, you know, in one way, one should not really ignore that climate vulnerability may cause security issue and creates uh, kind of uh, issues if there are border areas. For example, Rohingya issue, because, you know, they are people from the littoral region, uh, which is Arakan state of uh, Myanmar. They come to and take shelters in Cox's Bazar, Ukiya and Teknaf. These two areas are again littoral regions. Now, if a big um, climate disaster um, can always cause more vulnerability for them as they live in a situation um, and also at the steep hill, um, you know, lower side of the hill and, you know, sometimes soil erosion in the rainy season, monsoon season are also very problematic. So there are various ways of risk which should not be avoided at the same time, which should not be over securitized and militarized so that uh, that avoids the human perspective uh, in the geopolitics and mostly concentrate on on states narrative. So this is basically the differences between the critical geopolitical schools versus the state centric geopolitics of only considering the state's narrative. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Personal. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we are now approaching the, the, the time limit uh, for our meeting. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, for, for today's meeting. And I, 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 I trust and I believe this is not the, the last one, but the first one and the, the, the beginning of, of uh, our meetings within Geopolitical Tuesday and also uh, our other our seminars organized uh, by uh, uh, by War University of Warsaw and the Center for 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 uh, French culture. So thank you, thank you very much for today. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Kinga, for for uh, saving me uh, with my technical hiccups and and. Uh, uh, dear students, please remember about about the deadlines uh, on the on essays. Uh, do not do not forget it, and and uh, please uh, uh, take care. And uh, once again, happy new year! Thank you very much for today. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure, and I wish all the um, students participants. Um... Good luck for all kind of submissions and remember deadlines are not dead always. So thank you. All the best. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.